Praise the Lord. We'll stand up, please, as we pray together. Thank you very much. Let's close our eyes as we pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you for our Bible studies. Thank you for the great day you've given us to come to your word once again. Thank you, Lord, because you've given us the breath of life. So that as we come, keeping us alive physically, and it's so that we can be alive spiritually. As we come, Lord, we pray that you minister your word of life to everyone in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray that we'll not be hearers only, but we'll be doers of the word. That the grace to be obedient to your word, you give to every heart, every life in Jesus' name. That through this word, we become stabilized in the things of the Lord. That all the shifting and all the falling and rising, you cancel from our lives in Jesus' name. That a personal, spiritual, eternal life will be strengthened by the study. At the end will be an encouragement to all the people to lead them to higher ground in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. Prepare your people for the rapture. So that, Lord, as we study, it will not be in vain. And when we meet at the feet of Jesus on that final day, we'll say, the study of your word has profited and benefited us. Do it for us, Lord, even much more than we can ask. In Jesus' name we pray. We come to our study once again. We're coming to the concluding study. In the Sermon on the Mount. It's called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus Christ went up on the mountain top. We're, we're reading from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. And it's the teaching you have in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7. That's what is called the Sermon on the Mount. And the Lord has revealed quite a lot in all these verses of scripture. In the opening verse of the teaching itself, it talks about the kingdom. It tells us in Matthew chapter 5 verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As he continues, he keeps on talking about the kingdom. Because the goal of the message, the purpose of the preaching, and the very aim, the target of this Sermon on the Mount is to be able to get everyone out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That's why you find the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, emphasizing repeatedly the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And he wants us to concentrate, to focus, to center, zero in our attention, our heart, our aspiration, our desires on that kingdom. In fact, he wants us to brush every other thing aside or to use another language. He wants us to take every other thing in life with loose hands and then hold firmly the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. As you look at Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 33, you'll find that same emphasis, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. It says you put first things first. By the way, there are people that use that language. They talk about putting first things first. But they're not thinking like Christ. You put the things Christ calls the first things. You put that, the first thing. What's that? The kingdom of God and his righteousness and then it says after that all these things shall be added unto you as he brings the message of the sermon to a conclusion he still talks about the kingdom and he says it will be the greatest loss of your life if you missed the kingdom 
And then he described the people that will miss the kingdom. He tells us in verse 21 of chapter 7, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. I want you to underline the word doeth. The church, I don't mean a local church, and I don't mean a denominational church, and I don't mean this church alone. The church at large talks about believe, believe, believe. The evangelical church, the Pentecostal church, the universal church, we talk about believe. Unfortunately, some people in the church, the church at large, that's where they stop. Believe, full stop. But Jesus said it goes beyond believing. Even when you believe with the heart. That you need to put what you believe into demonstration. That's why it says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that, what's the word? Doeth to do, to observe to do. To practice, to live, to obey, to walk according to the word. It says those are the people that will get to the kingdom of God. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Now they are talking about the activities within the kingdom. It's talking about obedience in the kingdom. You see there are people that put all their emphasis on activities and programs and whatever it is in the kingdom working for the kingdom working for the lord being exercised in the operations and the activities of the kingdom and they do not think about doing and living and walking and obeying the laws of the king and so these people, many will say unto me, In that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. Then, and then, will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's what brings the message actually to a close, to a conclusion. And now in rounding up everything, the Lord Jesus Christ now comes to verse 24. He says, therefore, that's what therefore means, because of what I just told you now, that many will come to me in that day, and they will say, were well, we not active, active, very active in the operations of the activities of the kingdom? And then I will say unto them, I never knew you. He says, because of that. Because of the great disappointment on the final day. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. That's the word again. I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended. And the floods came. And the winds blew. And beat upon that house. And it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. That's not the end. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not. The people that rest their confidence in hearing. The people that rest their confidence in reading. The people that rest their hope on knowing. I know his will. I've read it. I've heard it. And I read so many chapters of the Bible every day. The people that read and stop there. The people that hear and stop there. The people that learn to know and they stop there. And they do not go beyond that to do in their personal lives. In their families. In their private lives. Those who just stay on Knowing it in the head, but not doing it with their lives. In verse 26, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man. 
That's a witchy word, a foolish man. When you understand what Jesus had said about calling somebody a fool, you understand this must be witchy. For the Lord, the God of glory, to call a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, a fool. And not to call him a fool when he can still make reparation, restoration. When he can still have a remedy. But to call him a fool at the end of life. At the beginning of eternity. That's a witchy word. Everyone that heard these sayings of mine. And doest them not shall be likened unto a foolish man. Which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended. Would you notice what happens in verse 27? Also happens in verse 25. You build your house on the rock. The rain will come. The winds will blow. The persecution will come. The temptations will come. Or you build your house on the sand. The same persecutions will come. And the same temptations and trials will come. And the same pressures will come. Whether you are here or there. Doesn't mean that problems will not arise. Problems arise everywhere. Build your house on the rock. In verse 27. And the rain descended. And the floods came. And the winds blew. And beat upon that house. And it fell. And great. That's what great means. Irreparable. Without remedy, final fall, and great was the fall of each. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished, they were amazed at his doctrine. For he taught them as one, having authority, and not as the scribes. In these uh, final verses of the sermon, the Lord is calling us to be wise unto salvation. Indeed, this is the goal of the whole of the scriptures and the goal of every message from the world. If you're a preacher, every time we preach, we must lead people to decide for heaven. We must lead people to think about whether they're ready for heaven or not. And if they're not ready, then to help them to understand what decisions to make. And what steps to take so that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, have the grace of God in their lives, have their sins forgiven, condemnation taken away, damnation taken away. And then to step, uh, to take the first step on their way to heaven. If they have believed already, to reaffirm, reassure them on the way to heaven and to encourage them to remain steadfast and movable in the way of the Lord. That's the goal of preaching. Multitudes of people had heard this great message from Christ, the Savior of the world. The Lord had revealed God's requirement for the blessed life. It was a great privilege to hear the truth of the kingdom from Christ himself. But Christ now makes us to understand. Hearing the word, even from Christ, the Lord of glory is not enough. There must be a proper response to the message that we have heard. And I want you, praise the Lord, for those of us who have been coming consistently as we have gone through all these messages. And maybe you are saying, praise the Lord, I didn't miss a single study. And we have to praise the Lord because he kept you healthy, kept you sound, kept you focused. And you kept on coming every Monday, every week, as we went through this great sermon on the mount. But now I need to, you know, tell you that you've done well in coming. You've done well in hearing. And are you doing well in doing and obeying and practicing what you have heard? Are you more humble today than you were before we started? Are you more meek today as a result of the study than the time we started? Are you purer today, pure in heart? Only the pure in heart shall see the Lord. Are you purer today than before we began? Are you enduring persecution, rejoicing in persecution today than what you did before? Are you putting it to practice? 
Are you taking care of the word of God? I come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And except your righteousness shall be greater, shall exceed the righteousness of scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Is your righteousness today greater than the righteousness before you started the study? And then it says that uh, when, you, when you see your brother is, has offended you, what you have to do is you have to go to him and reconcile with him. And if you are angry or you say, Raka or thou fool, you'll be in the danger of, the, of, of God, in danger of hell, hellfire. Are you more meek today, more gentle today, more tender today? Anger is gone and all those bitterness, everything is gone. Things are better now in your spiritual life than when you began. It's good to hear. It's good to come as we have come. But are we practicing the word? And he tells us not to swear. If you were swearing before you came and you had all these studies, are things better today? Do you use only wonderful language, truthful language, honest language, even today, but more than you did before? And then it says, when your neighbor forces you to go one mile, go with him twain. Are you like that today? Are you enduring today? If anybody asks you for anything that you have, and then you are to help, you should not restrain or restrict. You should give him. Are you doing that today? He says, love your enemy. And do good to them that despisedly use you. Are you better in that life of love and affection, relationship, reconciliation, in righteousness? Are you better today than he says, be ye perfect? Even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Are you going step by step and after the Lord Jesus Christ in that life of perfection? The question I'm asking is, you've done well that you have come. And you have been coming. All these times you have been studying. But the question is, have you put it to practice? Have you done it? I think it's better today than they were at that time. Didn't Jesus Christ say, when you bring, when you want to help somebody, you're going to give your arms. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Is it like that today? Or are you seeking the glory of men in whatever you do? And you're seeking the praise of men in whatever you, when you pray, you enter into your closet so that you'll not be appearing you know, to men to pray. Are you better in your prayer life today than before we start did that that you are not to attract attention and when you fast you will just you wash your face and then you anoint yourself so that you will not appear unto men to fast are you doing that today are we in religion for show in religion for demonstration in religion for public praise and he tells us how to pray our father which art in heaven are we following that pattern today as your prayer life your prayer content, your prayer request, as your prayer request changed, since we studied that, that's what the Lord is asking us. And then he says that you have a single eye. That means you have a pure motive. That there's no ulterior motive. There's no selfishness in anything that you're doing. Are you like that today? Since we studied that, it's not just to hear, but it is to put it into practice. And to say, yes, Lord, I thank you for what I learned. And every time I've come week after week, my life has been turned around. And my life has been changed. And then he says, take no thought for your life. Because you know that your life is more than, is more than raiment. And then God is feeding all those ravens. Would, would he not feed you your little faith? Are you free from anxiety today? Are you free from worry today? Are you free from the fear of man today? Than you were, more than you were at the beginning of the study. Then did he say, judge not? Don't criticize, don't condemn, don't tear people into pieces, don't gossip about their families, about, about anybody. Are we, are, are we doing that today? You see, it is a practice that matters. It's not just that I've been coming, I've been coming, but what have you been doing? How is your life, your Christian life, your righteous life, your spiritual life, you're following after the Lord? How is it better today than what it was? Are you wise in giving counsel to people, in advising people, because it says, don't give that which is holy unto the dogs. Now that's throw your peers before this one. Let's be turn around and rend you, and then what you have given them becomes useless. And then it says, 
your ask, it shall be given you. And seek, and you shall find and knock. It shall be opened unto you. Everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Are you doing that today? Are you still going to all the people, prophets, their man of God, their man of prayer, their prayer warrior, their pray for me? As they study of the word of God changed you. Didn't he tell us that whatsoever you want others to do unto you, do ye even so unto them. This is the whole law and the prophets. What he has told us about that golden rule. That anything that you are to do in relating with your neighbor, in talking to your neighbor, in dealing with your wife and dealing with your husband, that you are going to do it just according to the word. According to what you want them to do unto you. That, that's telling us you love God with all your heart all your soul and all your mind and you love your neighbor as yourself my question to you is is there any change in your life since we have we been studying all this sermon on the mount it shows us the narrow the straight gate and the broad way and then it tells us enter in through that straight gate that's a small gate and you walk in the narrow way are you walking the narrow way today or are you walking the broad way are you having given yourself latitude so that whatever you want to still do you or has the Lord broken and crushed the self will so that it's just the narrow path that leads to heaven that you are taking and then it says beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing it says you'll know them by their fruits are you more careful today in the books you read religious books you read religious gatherings that you go are you more careful today of all these false prophets that are throwing their leaflets and their cassettes and their tapes unto you or are you the one that is still propagating their false doctrine for them how have you taken to heart everything the lord has been teaching us that's why the lord said it is not just to hear the wise man the wise woman is the one that will look at this and will say yes i'm going to practice the word of god and since you had jesus say not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall get into the kingdom of heaven. How did you understand that? Do you think that all the churches are the same? All the fellowships are the same? Whether I'm here or in another church, it doesn't matter. Did you hear what Jesus said? If you're still running after uh, miracles and after casting out devils and after all those wonderful things, did you hear what Jesus said? That many will say unto me in that day, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name we have cast out devils and in thy name we have done many wonderful works and yet I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me ye that work iniquity. Now the Lord is saying, he has given you the word now. And you are to then pattern your life after those words he has given you. So that on the final day, it will not just be, I heard, I learned, I knew, I studied, I was regular at the study. The Lord will be asking you, what did you do with what you heard? How did the message you heard, how did that message change you? How did it transform you? What impact did it make in your life? Or did it just come in one ear and then went out the other ear? That's why the Lord in this conclusion is calling us and is saying, Do it. Learn it. Practice it. Learn it. Live by it. It is in that living by the word of God that makes us to have the reward. And the profit, the benefit of hearing the word of God on the final day. And as Jesus brings everything to a conclusion, he divides all the people that heard. He divides everybody to two groups, two classes. These two groups of people are classified as wise or foolish. The two groups have some similarities among them. I've read the text to you already. They both hear the word of God. This group that group, they both heard the word of God. Not only that, number two, they both know the way of salvation as revealed by Christ. Number three, they built a house of spiritual life after hearing God's word. Number four, they both builders think that their houses will stand and will stand the tests and the trials of life. Not only that, number five, the outward appearances of their spiritual houses look alike. 
These similarities are superficial. The houses look all right. The one for the wise and the one for the foolish until the rain descended, until the winds blew, until the storm came, until the waves beat upon those two houses. They look alike. It's like we are doing well and they are doing well. Both the foolish and the wise looks like they are the same. It is when the storm comes you'll know the difference between them. The differences actually determine the strength and the quality of our spiritual lives. One house has its foundation on the rock. The other with no foundation is built upon the sand. One group of hearers obey the word of repentance and the word of righteousness. The other group, they do nothing. They do, they do not obey the word. The wise man receives grace to live in obedience to God's word. The foolish man merely hears the word without living in obedience to that word. The wise man will rejoice throughout eternity while the foolish will weep and cry and suffer throughout eternity. I pray you'll be wise. As we come to this study tonight, I divide to three parts. Number one, the foundation of loving obedience to Christ's word. The foundation of loving obedience to Christ's word. Number two, the foolishness of living without obedience to Christ's word. The foolishness of living without obedience. That means living in disobedience to Christ's word. Number three, the failure of listeners who observed Christ's wisdom. They sought the wisdom in his word. They sought the authority with which he declared the truth. But their reaction was just that they appreciated it without plunging themselves heart, spirit, soul, and body into obedience to that what the failure of listeners who observed Christ's wisdom. Let's come to number one, the foundation of loving obedience to Christ's word. I'm reading Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 and 25. Matthew chapter 7 verse 24, therefore whosoever Therefore, whosoever, I'm sure you understand that whosoever is very important. God is not a respecter of persons. And it's not a respecter of position. And it's not a respecter of personality. And it's not a respecter of your profession. And it's not a respecter of your title. It is the whosoever, the word of God, the laws of God are for everyone. And it says, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Do you see that word do? It's not that he did them. It's not that he is still planning and proposing and thinking that he will do them in the future. He's doing them in the present tense. He's doing them constantly. He's doing them continually. He's doing them promptly. He's doing them whatever the challenge of life may be. In the day and in the night. He doers. At a time of prosperity and adversity, he doers. In the time of health and sickness, he doers. And in the time with friends or foes, he doeth. In the time of joy and in the time of sadness, he doeth. You know, there are some people, their, their Christianity fluctuates. When they are happy, they do. When they are sad, they don't do. When you, when you befriend them, then they obey the word of God. If you, if you step back a little bit, then they don't obey the word of God. When the world is smiling at them, then they are so happy the world is smiling at them. And then they do, they obey. And when the world is frowning at them, persecuting them, opposing them, then they don't do. When things are going on right with them, and it appears everybody is contributing to help them pay their house rent and, and pay their bills and do this and do that, then they are happy. And then they come to church and they do. But when it appears that the phones are drying up and the money is not coming as it used to come, then they withdraw and they cannot do the will of God anymore. When the church gives them opportunity of ministry, position, 
They do. And then they run. And then they say, I believe in God. I love my church. I love the word of God. I'm going to be obedient to the word of God. If the church withdraws that opportunity of ministry and service, then they don't do. You see all those people that are fluctuating in the obedience to the Lord, their motive for obeying the Lord is not the glory of God. Their motive is just their personal, selfish ambition. And everything revolves around them. But if you really love the Lord, it doesn't matter what is happening. It doesn't matter up or down, on the mountain top or in the valley, with friends or with foes, in the day, in the night, prosperity or adversity, sickness or health. You do. Do the will of God. That's why it says, and doeth them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. He's telling us about these people that built on the foundation. I'm looking at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 verse 47. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them. He heareth and he doeth them. He listens and then he doeth them. He learns and he doeth them. What that means is that every time you hear the word of God, you go back to your family. And whatever is not actually straightened out before, you now straighten it out according to the word. Every time you hear the word of God, you look at your attitude. And everything in your attitude that is not according to the word of God, you straighten everything out. Every time you hear the word of God, you go back to your place of work. And then whatever you have been doing in that place of work, which is not according to the word, you straighten everything out. You hear and you do. And the more you hear, the more you do. And you allow what you hear to affect every part of your life. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sins and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep. And digged deep. Have you found people that they don't even dig at all? All they do is raise up their hands and they crusade. That's all they do. They don't dig into their heart and see the depths of corruption, defilement, sin, depravity in their heart and dig everything out before they can lay that foundation. You dig deep so you can have real total repentance. Have you, have you noticed some people that come to church and they hear the word of God for one hour, one and a half hours, and then after hearing the word of God, oh Lord, eh, thank you, I've heard your word, and this is wonderful, I thank you for what I, I've had today, and eh, thank you very much, keep me, I'm going back home now, and keep me and protect me, don't let me fall into any hands of evil people, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Where's the digging deep? When you hear the word of God, you examine your heart. You dig deep into your, into your conscience, into your heart, into your life. And you examine your life. And you allow this word of God to dig deep into you. That, that's what Jesus said. That the wise man is the one that had the word of God. And then during the time of prayer, he's meditating on that word. He's examining himself with that word. He's examining his relationship with his wife, with his children, with his parents. And then with his neighbors, with people in the church. He's digging deep. Is that right? Did I do that well? Did I say that well? Is that a According to the will of God. Is God happy with this? Is God pleased with this? Is my heart, my conscience right in the sight of the Lord? That's the digging deep is talking about. And as to dig deep. And then you then bring the word of God. The blood of Jesus to cleanse you and to wash you. And the grace of God to stabilize you. And make you not to walk in the way of righteousness. And then you take some real decision. Some precious decisions by the grace of God. I'm not going to be today as I was yesterday. And I'm going to live tomorrow in a better way on the basis of this word of God I'm hearing. The way I think and the way I talk and the things I do and the places I go and the interactions, the fellowships I keep. That's the digging deep. And it is when you do that that Jesus said the word you have heard is actually benefiting you. It is digging deep and it laid the foundation upon a rock. And when the flood arose 
and, and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock. Now, so you think about the foundation that Jesus spoke about. You know, many people, the only thing they know about foundation is that Jesus is the foundation. That's right. That's right. But it, it's more than that. Christ is the foundation. Let's see where that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're looking at uh, verse 11. For the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But you know what, he's what the Lord is telling us? He's saying, yes, I am the foundation and the word I'm speaking to you. Obedience to that word is the foundation of the Christian life. I'm speaking to you about repentance. Obedience to that word of repentance. That's foundation. I speak to you about righteousness. Obedience to the word of Christ on righteousness. That's the foundation of your Christian life. And I speak to you about holiness and sanctification. And obedience to that word. Didn't you pray for the church? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Obedience to that word. That's the foundation. And it speaks to us about restitution. Don't forget that. That when you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother, your sister, something against you, you leave your gift at the altar. That, that's not an outdated doctrine, it's the doctrine of Christ. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if Jesus Christ is still the same, his doctrine, his teaching is still the same. And when you hear that, obedience to that word of Christ, restitution. That is the foundation that the Lord Jesus is talking about. He that heareth my words and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man who dig deep and then he laid the foundation upon the rock. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. That's the foundation now. The foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You see that foundation? To depart from iniquity. And then to, uh, to so depart and separate yourself from everything that is evil. Repentance, I told you, and faith in Christ, that's foundation. In Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance and from dead works and of faith toward God. The foundation of repentance and then the foundation of faith toward God. God. And we have to lay that foundation if we're going to move on in a Christian life, living a life of righteousness. It tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, foundation. 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're looking at verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in certain riches. They be not high-minded because of the possession you have. Not high-minded because of the wealth you have. Not high-minded because of the skill you have. Not high-minded because of what you have in your bank account. Not to be high-minded, not trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, and when you do that, don't you see that's the Christian life? Ready to communicate, to touch other people's lives positively. What's that? That's a foundation. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on life eternal. So the Lord then is telling us it's very important to think of the words of Jesus Christ and lay the foundation of your life on the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 verse 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What does that mean? It says that don't be spiritually anemic. Don't be spiritually weak. 
Don't have a weakened stamina. Taking the word of God like you're taking the food. And let the food or the bread of life you take, let it show that it's dwelling in you richly, affecting your mind and your brain and your thoughts and your decisions and your aspirations and your ambition. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So that like, it, like the blood fills your veins. If anybody pinches you at all, it is a word that comes out. If you're going to take any decision at all, it's going to be the word that will be the basis of that decision. If anybody is asking you something, the response you make is going to be based upon that word. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. And then it says, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in the Psalms and hymns and spirit spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatsoever you do think about that whatsoever you do when the word of God fills you saturates you influences you inspires you and leads you in everything you say and do then it says whatsoever you do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to the Father by him I pray God will help us that this word will do it and will obey it in Jesus' name. That's where wisdom is. Our wisdom begins with hearing the word of God with a purposeful heart to obey. There is no wisdom in hearing and not doing. Hearing about repentance, not doing it. Hearing about believing and not doing it. Hearing about entering into the kingdom of God and not doing it. Hearing about hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And not even paying attention to it. That's no wisdom. But when you are pure in heart. And you walk in the light glorifying God. In all that we do. That is a wisdom. The wise builder builds on a strong foundation. That will withstand all the storms of life. Christ is the foundation of the Christian life. Yet we need to remember that Christ himself refers to the foundation as obedience to the word of God. Obedience to the words of Christ. A gracious life of godliness is the unassailable foundation of the wise builder whose house will stand until eternity. True wisdom consists in building a spiritual house on the rock. Jesus Christ making the building firm and strong by having our motives, our tempers, our lives conformed to the word of God. Leaning on nothing else but his grace to enable us with power, with authority to be able to do everything he has called us to do. We we'll come to point number two. In point number two, we're reading from Matthew chapter 7, verses 26 and 27. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 26. And everyone that heareth these says of mine, and doeth them not. That's in the present tense. You see, there are many people that will refer to their past experience in Christ. And he'll say, at this particular year, I was, was, I was born again. Oh, I remember my consecration of many years ago. I remember my devotedness, my commitment to obeying the Lord many years ago. Let me give you an example. And then they bring out a particular item in the story of their lives. And they will say, those were the good old days I did the will of God. I obeyed the will of God. In fact, many people were looking at me as if I was a peculiar, strange person. But you know, the Lord doesn't care about what it was in the past. He's asking, what do you do today? Doest them not. It is not the activity of the past, the devotion of the past, the consecration of the past, the obedience of the past, the devotedness of the past, the sacrifice of the past, the submission of the past. Doest them not in the present day. I remember my humility of the past. How about today? I remember my submission of the past. How about today? I remember my commitment of the past. How about today? I remember my sacrifice of the past. How about today? If somebody were to tell you and remind you, see what you did 10 years ago. See the way you were humble 5 years ago. And see the way you were so committed about 11 years ago. You, if you'll say... Huh, 
I don't know the kind of grace I had at that time. I cannot tell. And the kind of, uh, the, the kind of power I had at that time, I, I don't know where I got that part today. I don't think I can do that. There you are. There you are. If your past is greater than the present, you are not out of the race. If your humility of the past is greater than your humility of the present, if your devotedness of the past is greater than your devotedness of the present day, if your obedience to the word of God, your submission to the word of God is a greater in the past than today, you are not out of the race. The Lord is not, is, is not talking about what you did in the past, what you were in the past. He says, he, in verse 20, in verse 26, everyone that heard these sins of mine and doest present tense and doest them not. How many of us were so submissive to the will of God in the past? You were going to do something and you put a lot of money to that thing ignorantly. And then somebody just came and said, what are you doing? Do you remember this verse of scripture? Immediately he opened the scriptures to you and say, I didn't know that before. I stop it. You cancel that thing. All the money you have invested into that thing, I don't care. Doing the will of God is number one in my life. But today, can you do that? Today, you have not even expended so much money. You are just getting started. And somebody came and he said, look at the Bible. Look at the word of God. Oh, I didn't know that before. But you know it now. It's too late. I'm still going to know what I'm going to do. You are taking a decision. In the past, you are taking a decision. Don't you remember you wanted to get married to an unbeliever? And then you became converted. And somebody just opened the Bible to you with all the affection, the interaction, and the connection you had with that person. Say, that's all, good night. I cannot do that anymore. That's how you obeyed the Lord before. Today, you want to, you want to do something. And somebody says, look at the Bible. <laughs> I don't say, just please, don't disturb my peace. I, I've made up my mind. I want to do this thing. God will just have to forgive me if this thing is wrong. I cannot go back from it now. There you are. You're not doing the will of God. You cannot in a prompt way right there, cut off that thing and say, now I know it's not the will of God. Good night, goodbye. I cannot put my hand in that thing again. That's what the Lord is saying. It's present tense obedience to the word of God. Whosoever, everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. Luke chapter 6, verse 49. In Luke chapter 6, verse 49, But he that heareth and doeth not. Oh, notice it's always in the present tense. It's not what you did in the past. You know some people, when they, when they take a wrong step, and they do something wrong, and then you challenge them, you correct them, you rebuke them, you chastise them, or maybe you discipline them. Oh, they will say, they didn't even look at what I did in the past. All these years, look at what I've done. And I don't think anybody has any faithfulness comparable to mine. It's true, I've done this one wrong, but look at what I did in the past. It's not what you did in the past. What you do today, in the present tense. It says, he that heareth and doeth not. It's like a man that without a foundation built and house upon the, upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great irreparable and without remedy the Lord is telling us then that what's important is not just hearing but doing the will of God as we look at our nation this country and any or any other country in Africa and beyond Africa, many more and more people are hearing the word of God in this nation and in many other nations. But how many are keeping and doing and obeying what they hear? 
He who reads or hears the word of God but does not ask can receive grace for, from God to conform his life to that word is like a fool whose foolishness will stink him throughout eternity. Knowing and learning of Christ's righteousness. Knowing and learning of Christ's sacrifice and atonement. While we do not pray to conform to his word in our daily lives is terrible self-deception. Let it be observed and seriously considered that it is not the man who hears or professes to believe a decent of Christ, but he who doeth, that is the man who consistently obeys the word of God, that will be blessed of God. Many people suppose that obedience to the word of Christ is unnecessary as long as we believe on him. There are some people in, in the church, I mean the church at large, their doctrine is only believe. Only believe. How about my life? Just believe. How about what I do? Just believe. If you can just believe, that settles the matter. But Jesus, the Lord, the King, the Savior, he tells us in this message of the kingdom, he says, only believing is not enough. Do it. Have the grace of God in your life that you'll practice, you'll do what the Lord himself has commanded some people think that that's not necessary anymore. But they are wrong because Jesus is right. I said Jesus is right. And Jesus knows more than any church leader. And he knows more than any theologian. The gospel of grace was brought to us by Christ to liberate us from sinning. And from disobedience to lead us in the way of obedience to our heavenly father. The house or the Christian profession that has no foundation of repentance, no foundation of faith, no foundation of obedience, no foundation of righteousness will not stand the waves of trial and temptation on earth. Neither will it stand the storm of judgment and wrath on that final day. That's why it's so important that we will obey the word of God. God will give you grace. And the number one thing in your life, priority of your life will be hearing the word and doing, obeying, practicing what you hear. In Proverbs chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 24. Proverbs chapter 1, reading from verse 24. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel. And would not and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your when your when your fear comes, when your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me for for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. The Lord is telling us that what becomes important, essentially indispensable in our lives is obedience to the teaching, the instruction, the counsel that he gives us. He tells us in First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, we're looking at it from verse 10 through to verse 15. First John chapter 3 verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Two groups of people, two classes of people, two camps of people. The children of God, those who are obeying, those who are doing righteousness. And the children of the devil, those who are not doing it. They only hear, they don't do. It says, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that she had from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. You know that we are passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth its brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in 
him. The important saying is being righteous, doing righteousness, going the way of the Lord, and fulfilling the will of God in obedience to the word of God that we are hearing, and not just doing that once in a while, but doing that constantly and consistently, persisting, pursuing holiness, and going after holiness and the fear of the Lord all the days of our lives. In Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Then he tells us, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Think about that root of bitterness springing up within you. If you listen to the words of Jesus and you, you take to heart all those words we have heard in the Sermon on the Mount, there's no way the root of bitterness will rise up and spring up in your heart again. Whatever people do, they want to force you to go in mind. You go with them twain. You go with the right attitude and you say, is that enough? I'm, I'm even ready to do more. You're not going to have bitterness. And it says, forgive as your father in heaven has forgiven you. If you have that, are you going to have any root of bitterness? No. And then it says, you keep your heart pure because only the pure in heart shall see the Lord. If your heart is pure from day to day and moment to moment, are you going to have root of bitterness? The answer is no. And it says, when you're persecuted, rejoice because great is your reward in heaven if you are rejoicing during persecution are you going to have any root of bitterness the answer is no that's what the lord is saying hear these words of christ and then lead your life guide your life live your life according to that word and then you'll be ready for life eternal i said you're ready for life eternal in verse 16 lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright for ye know that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing he was rejected for he found no place of repentance he wanted to lay the foundation the foundation of repentance which he should have laid many many years before it was too late for him i pray it will not be too late for for you though he sought it carefully with tears this obedience to the word of god is so important let me read to you before i go on to uh, number three in luke chapter 12 luke chapter 12 we're reading from verse 46 luke 12 verse 46 the lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him it's very dangerous to live your life without thinking about the rapture it's very dangerous for you to take any decision without thinking about the coming of the Lord. It's very dangerous for you to just befriend people and associate with them without thinking of what the Lord will think on the day when he comes. It's very dangerous for you to just move on in life and just go from activity to activity and program to program and service to service without thinking about the coming of the Lord. It's very dangerous for you to just listen to what your parents are saying, what your neighbors are saying, what your director at the place of work is saying. Do this and do that without thinking about the coming of the Lord. We are not like them. They are not expecting the coming of the Lord. They are not. They, what do they know about the rapture? What do they know about the resurrection of the dead? What do they know about the change that will take place in a twinkling of an eye? We are the people that the Lord has given that revelation to. And he has told us that a time is coming, a day is coming. When Christ will appear in the skies and the dead in Christ shall rise. And those of us which are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Forever to be with the Lord. And it's very dangerous for you to go from day to day without thinking of how will this thing I'm going to do affect me on the day of rapture, on the day of resurrection? Be wise and think of the coming of the Lord. In verse 46, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him. And in an hour when he is not aware and will cut him asunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. The one who has learned, who has known, who has read, who has studied. 
and he knows the master's will, the Lord's will, the word of the Lord, and he doeth it not. He will be beaten with many stripes. But how about those who don't know? Look at verse 48. But he that knew not and did commit things, worthy of strife shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they shall they will ask the more. Well, the, the emphasis of the Lord is that we should not be hearers only, we should be doers of the word. And we're going to be doers of the word. The grace to do it. The strength to do it. The determination, discipline, diligence to do it. I pray the Lord will give to every one of us. We come to point number three now. In point number three, we're talking about the failure of the listeners who only observed Christ's wisdom. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 28 to verse 29. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. It says the people were surprised. It says the people were amazed. In fact, that's not the only place where it tells us that. If you look at Mark chapter 1, verse 21, verse 22. Mark chapter 1, verse 21. And when and, he, and they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. This one is not on the mountain top. This one now is in the synagogue. And they were astonished at his doctrine. Even in the synagogue. On the mountain top, the same thing. In the synagogue, the same thing. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. But as you come to Matthew chapter 22, you are going to see the same thing. The astonishment, the amazement. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 22. It says, when they had heard these words, they marveled and they left him and went their way. In verse 33, and when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. That means that everywhere Jesus went in the plain, on the mountain top, in the synagogue, in the midst of the multitude, when he taught them, they showed their surprise. Well, he had shown them the way into the kingdom of God. That surprised them. He had revealed the depth of the meaning and application of the law of God unto them. They never had that before that way. He had pierced their consciences with the sharp sword of the spirit. And the word of God never searched them like that before. And never probed them like that before. He had turned on the light, the searching light of the searching the secrets of the hearts and exposing the shallowness of the religious practices. And then they began to think about all the things they have done in their religious lives. And everything crumbled to the ground. His teaching had awakened them and brought them to the point of decision. What will they do? Will they walk in the narrow way or will they persist in the broad way? They had heard what they had never heard from their religious leaders. They felt the authority and the power in his word. His explanations were persuasive. His statements were piercing. His illustrations were practical and pertinent. His conclusion was arresting and thought-provoking. His conduct demanded, commanded uh, respect and attention. His, his whole approach was compelling and it demanded their decision. There was no frivolous allusion. There was no traditional inference. There was no quotation from any inspired writers. There was no fable from heathen philosophers. The whole sermon was pure, profound and powerful. It was amazingly simple in its presentation and yet so astonish, astonishingly sublime in its precepts. That's why they were surprised. That's why they were amazed, astonished as to what Jesus Christ taught, as to how Jesus Christ taught. I'll come back to this Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, we're coming back to verse 28 and, 20, and verse 29. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these says, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority 
and not as the scribes. But the question is, were they saved? Were they born again? Did they repent? Did they yield their lives? Did they do like the Philippian jailer when that miracle happened in Acts of the Apostles chapter 16? And then rushed in with light and said, men and brethren, I see my shallowness. I see my emptiness. I see my depravity. I see my sinfulness. What shall I do to be saved? Did they do that? They were surprised and astonished. Were they, were they saved? Did they do like those people in Acts of the Apostles when the word of God pricked them in their hearts? After Peter had spoken to them. And then they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Did they do that? Did they do like Saul of Tarsus? When that light came from heaven, it fell to the ground. And then he had the word Saul, Saul, what persecutest thou me? It's a hard thing for you to kick against the priest. And then he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And then he fell down. He just submitted his life and said, Lord, what shall I do? Did they do that? It's not just enough to compare preachers. Look at this message you have heard. It's better than the message of the scribes and the Pharisees. That's not the purpose of the preaching. It is to strike you at your heart and to pinch you at your, at your heart and then to make you fall on your knees and say, Lord, what shall I do? That's the reason why the Lord is speaking to us. And that's the reason why you are coming to the Bible study today. That the word of the Lord will strike you at the heart. And then you'll say, Lord, what will you have me to do? These people that were surprised. What was their reaction after that surprise? After that amazement? After that astonishment. And let's see some of the things that actually happened after they were surprised and amazed. We're looking at Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 22. Luke chapter 4, verse 22. It says in verse 22, And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And he said, Is not this Joseph's son? Can you imagine that? That's all they could say. After they were surprised, amazed about the words of Jesus Christ. Then they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me, This Proverbs physician, Heal thyself, whatsoever ye have, we have heard, done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Can you imagine that even though they were amazed at his words, the gracious words coming out of him, yet this is where they ended up. And then he began to tell them more. Then he said, you know, he continues in verse 28, all day that when the synagogue when, when they heard these were filled with wrath. He began to apply the word to them. He began to show them how dirty and defiled they were. He began to tell them how disobedient and rebellious they were. He began to tell them how, how they had gone astray. As long as I was preaching in the general, just coaching the word, applying it to everybody, they didn't mind. They, they were amazed at the words coming out of his mouth. The moment he began to pinpoint, look at this and look at this, I began to touch them in the delicate parts of their heart, of their thought, of their mind. Then it says, they were filled with wrath in verse 29, and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong look at that attitude well, it says they were amazed in verse 22 yet the amazement did not lead them to repentance Luke chapter 11 I'm reading from verse 27 Luke chapter 11 verse 27 there's another person that was amazed and look at her own reaction and it came to pass as he spake these words a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him blessed is the womb that bear thee and the palms that thou hast sought that's all she could say. She had the word of God. And then she said, your mother must be a great, special, blessed woman. The one that gave birth to you, this is wonderful. That's, that's all the conclusion she could reach. But Jesus said, but he said, yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. 
Jesus brought her back to what the right attitude ought to be. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 40 and verse 41. Beware therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken in the prophets. Behold ye despisers and wonder and perish. You see, there are people that will be amazed, surprised, and then they'll wonder. And yet all the wonder will not lead them to salvation, but to perdition. Will not lead them unto righteousness, but unto more rebellion. They just hear the word. They enjoy the word. They taste the word as the drunkards are tasting their wine. But to give their heart and to give their mind, and to give their will, and to surrender their personality to the obedience of that word, and then to allow the hammer of the word to crush their self-will, and their stubbornness, all, the, all that they will not do, only to taste the word as the, as the drinkers or the drunkards taste their wine. And those people will wander and perish. Verse 41, Behold, ye despise us and wander and perish. For I walk a wonder in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. I pray that you will not be our Lord. He spoke, Christ spoke to them, and is speaking to us today with the authority of a king. It taught as one inspired from above, as a teacher sent from God. And it says the people were astonished. It was a great comment that they were astonished, but a grave crime that led them to condemnation. That they were astonished and nothing more. Did they immediately repent of all their sins? Did they mourn for their sins? The spiritual hunger drive them to seek righteousness by faith? Did they become purer in heart as to so that they can see God on the final day? Yes, astonished. I pray that your own astonishment will lead you to go through the straight gate. Will lead you to walk with Christ in the narrow way. And then the astonishment you have as you study all these things. Blessed are your eyes for what you see. And blessed are your ears for what they hear. For the kings and the prophets of old have desired to hear these things. But you hear them. But God has brought them to you full and free like this. I pray to lead you to faithful, loyal obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that your wonders will not stop here. But you will enter into the wonders of heaven. To live together with Christ for all eternity in Jesus name. The Lord has shown us the way into life. And he wants us to take that way into life. Now we've had the word of God. We need the grace. Don't we need grace? I said we need grace. We need the grace to be obedient to the word of God. That's why we're going to stand up. And we're going to pray that God will grant us the grace. Not to be hearers of the word only. But will be doers of the word. Let's, let's talk to the Lord in prayer. You've had quite a lot today. As you have been hearing every time. And the Lord is saying. Let's be wise. Don't let us be foolish. And don't let us just hear and then go away. And then let's spend some quality time. And talk to the Lord in prayer. That God himself will put these words in our hearts and will lay by this word. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. You have, a, you have heard about the word of repentance. Are you digging deep into your heart, searching your heart, examining yourself, probing yourself? The depravity there, the defilement there. Are you finding out? The things that will hinder you from getting to the kingdom of God. Are you digging them up and throwing them away? Are you saying, oh Lord, I just need your grace. Think about the depths of your heart. The defilement, the damnation there. The things that are not according to the will of God, according to the word of God in your heart there. Find out. Don't just come. Don't just listen. Don't just hear. If there's any coldness in you, tell the fire of the Spirit of God to come and burn all that refuse in your heart. And then take the coldness and the lukewarmness away. So you can be zealous in the path of righteousness and obedience to the word of the Lord. 
It's not the hearers of the word that are justified in the sight of God, but the doers of the word. He commands you to repent. He commands you to believe. He commands you to receive grace. The grace to live according to the word of God. And he calls you to a life of obedience step by step, day after day, week after week, all through your life. And he wants the word of God to have such a great impact on you. It will make a change so that you'll be purer today than you were yesterday. Holier today than you were yesterday. More humble today than you, than you were yesterday. More devoted, submissive, surrendered today than you were yesterday. That the word of God day after day cleansing you and purging you, purifying you will make a great change in your life, in your relationship between you and your wife, between you and, and the almighty God, between you and your fellow man, between you and your children, between you and your parents, between you and your teachers, between you and your neighbors, that the word of God will have such an impact upon your life. That you will know you are climbing higher and higher every day in the past, in the way of obedience. And the people around you will know you are not like you were yesterday. You are not like you were last week. This world is cleansing you, purging you, purifying you. And it wants to make you white, whiter than snow. This world is changing your attitude. This world is changing your behavior. This world is changing your action. This world is changing your consecration for the better. This world is making you stronger in the things and the way of the Lord. And that's the purpose of hearing the word of God. He that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. I would like you not to be a wise man. Be wise today. Be wise today. Be wise today. If you are hearing the word of God, it doesn't lead you into the wisdom of salvation. And you are not born again of what use it is. Of what use it is. You are hearing the word, you are still as sinful as ever. You are hearing the word, you are still as dirty as ever. You are hearing the word, you are still as defiled as ever. You are hearing the word, you are still as unconverted as ever. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of Christ and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case, in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Let the word of God bring the righteousness of God into your heart, into your life. Pray and say, Lord, today I'm ready now. Today I'm ready now. I want righteousness. I want righteousness to come into me. Your righteousness. The righteousness of Christ imputed imparted unto you a great change a great transformation so you become transparently holy transparently humble transparently devoted unto the lord no atom out of hypocrisy in your life what you are in heart you are in life what you are in the private you are in the public what you are in church you are in the place of work Tell the Lord, oh Lord, walk on me. I don't just want to be a hearer of the word only. I want this word to walk in me. Walk in me. Walk in me. Or oh, the power, power divine, the power of the almighty God to turn everything around in my life. Change my language. To change my attitude. And make me dependent upon the Lord more and more devoted to the Lord more and more, surrendered unto the Lord more and more, yielded unto the Lord more and more, consecrated unto the Lord more and more. Once I hear the word of God correcting my action, correcting my life, taking a prompt action immediately. That's the beauty of the wise man's life. He hears the word and the word affects him, influences him. Let the word influence you. Let it affect you. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine. And do us them. Do us them. You are some boy as you have in the words of Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The humble. Blessed are the meek. Those who are tender, gentle and gentle. Who can be molded by the hands of the almighty God. Blessed are they that mourn, they shall be comforted. You know, you've seen any sin, any infirmity, any, any evil that you've done, the Lord is revealing, showing you the light. What you've done that is wrong. 
you mourn in the sight of the Lord and you repent in dust and ashes in real sorrow of heart. Say, no, Lord, have mercy on me. I want to be clean. I want to be pure. I want to be holy. I want to be righteous. Put in th first things first. Your priority should be the kingdom of God. Say, no, Lord, here I am. Oh, Lord, here I am. I want to live a life that pleases you. A life that is submissive unto you. A life that is lived in daily obedience, continual obedience, persistent obedience to the word of the Lord. Lord, do it in me. Make of me another Enoch today, another Daniel today, another Samuel today, another John today, another Paul today. That my life will please you in everything that I do. He can do it, he can do it. Another Ruth today, another Esther today, another Mary today, another Elizabeth today. Just following after the will and the word of the Lord. Talk to the Lord. The blood of Jesus washes whiter than snow. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Yes, he can do it. His willing is ready. Then just stand there, pray. And say, Lord, 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 here am I. Do it in me. So that there will be no condemnation on the final day. Move away from just mere, shallow, meaningless, religious activity. And come into real obedience to the word of God. Say, oh Lord, I yield my heart, I yield my soul, I yield my mind. I surrender everything in obedience, total surrender, yieldedness to the word of the Lord. Let this word affect your attitude towards your wife, towards your husband, towards your children, towards your parents, towards your neighbors, towards the brothers and the sisters. A righteous life, a saintly life, a holy life before the Lord. And let this sermon on the mount be the measure of your life every time. Reading it every time. Matching your life with it every time. And taking in those details of the sermon on the mount day by day, week after week. It's still in the Bible. Don't say we've finished it now. We've, we've concluded it now. Still so keep on reading it. Keep on searching your life by it. Keep on matching your life, every detail of your life, by everything you read there. That the righteousness of God in Christ will be imputed and imparted unto you day by day. And you'll be walking in the steps of Christ, following after the footsteps of Christ every time. For this is the message of the King of Kings. And all the citizens of his kingdom must live by this message. Pray and tell the Lord, oh Lord, every day I want to just live like this. I want to live like this. I want to live by this word of God. Let it crush me, cleanse me, purge me, purify me. Oh Lord, help me. Help me. And the Lord will help you. The Lord will help you. If you will give yourself fully surrendered unto the Lord. And let this word, just the word. You are not living by feeling. You are not living by opinions of men. You're not living by the standards of society. You're not living by the policies of anyone. You're living by these principles of the kingdom of God. And you're telling the Lord, oh Lord, let this word of God really have impact in my life. Then that's what you're sure when you have the fruit of the spirit. You have the righteousness of the kingdom. You have the very life and the mind of Christ imparted and imputed unto you. That's what we need. Tell the Lord. You need grace, strength, divine ability. Christ to dwell in you richly. Christ himself to live within you. And the almighty God says, I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. I will move in them. So that every word you speak, everything you do, every step you take will be on the basis of this word of God. Tell the Lord. Lord, grant me the grace. Make sure you're saved, you're born again. Anyone who is not born again is spiritually dead. And a dead man, a dead woman, a dead boy, girl, cannot do the activities of a living man. 
We are going to walk after the living God and live as, as the living God wants you to live. You must come and live spiritually. Life. Life in Christ. The life of righteousness. The life in partage by the divine power of the almighty God must come into you. And it is that that will make you to be able to follow after these teachings given to us by Christ, the son of the living God. They empower you. They strengthen you. Make you to be what you ought to be. So that every day, every moment, the word will be very significant to you. And you're thinking about the coming of the Lord, about the rapture. The people of the world are not thinking about that. So that the Lord will not come in a day you're not expecting. So that every step you take, every word you speak, every move you make, every decision you take, will be based upon this word that the Lord has been teaching us. Plunge into the word. Measure your life by the word. Weigh your life by the word. So it will not be too late for you when the Lord will say that wage in the balances and you are found wanting. Be cleansed today. Be washed today. Be purged today. Be purified today. Have more grace of more of the grace of God in your life today. The grace that will carry you through. The grace that will make you to live like a real child of God. Beloved child of God. Living a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. Not pleasing yourself. Not pleasing the devil. Not pleasing the world. But pleasing yourself. Pleasing the Lord. That whatsoever ye do. In word or deed. Whether ye eat or drink. Or whatsoever it is. A life that is pleasing unto the Lord. Come before the Lord and he will give you grace. The grace to live according to the teaching of his word. He has the power to back up his promises. He has the power to do what he has said he will do. He has the power to create in you a new heart, a new life. To make you a new creature in him. So that you walk on the way that leads unto life. He can do it for you. He saves. He sanctifies. He empowers. He strengthens us. And in that strength of the Lord. Granted and given by his grace. We are able to live day by day. Consistently. Victorious in Christ. Victorious over temptation. Victorious even in the time of persecution. And we live a life that befits a real child of God. Living, worshipping, walking in the beauty of holiness. Remember, not only the hearers of the word are justified before God. But the doers of the word. Be a wise man, a wise woman, a wise boy, a wise girl. Whosoever hear these sayings of mine and doeth them. I will liken unto a wise man that dig deep and built his house on the rock. And the storm, the rain, the wind, the waves descended and blew upon that house. And it stood firm. Don't be a foolish man. Don't be a foolish woman. Don't be a foolish girl. Don't be a foolish boy. Whosoever hear these sayings of mine. And doeth them not. Or liken him unto a foolish man. That built his house without a foundation on the sand. And the rain descended. And the floods came. And the rain came, and the waves beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the ruin of it. Be wise, hear the word, 
Receive grace from the Lord and do it. And do it consistently.